Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, as we all know, we are working through the book of Colossians under the series titled Christ at the Center. And this week, I'm going to share a message with you uh, that kind of touches on a, a tough subject. Uh, I've titled this sermon Rejoicing in Our Sufferings. So you can understand that suffering is not something that we want to hear a sermon about on a normal day. But anyway, just to present a context to this passage, uh, we have seen that Paul is writing this letter from Hauserus, probably in Rome, and he's writing to a church that he's never been to. And this passage presents um, his sense of authority or why should they listen to whatever he's trying to say is on the basis of his suffering and his identity as a servant of the church. So I don't want to read the entire passage. Um, I'll just read the first verse, Colossians 1 and verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So here you can see that the title, I've just taken it from the first part of this verse, which is uh, where Paul is talking about rejoicing in his sufferings. And uh, I, I, I want to break down this passage to help, and help us to identify it. How could Paul say this? How could Paul rejoice in his sufferings? How could Paul make the statement? So I want to uh, present the first reason I feel that Paul is able to say he's able to rejoice in his sufferings is because he was not suffering for himself, but he's suffering for the church. He mentions here in what was suffered for you. So specifically, he suffered for the Colossian church. And he is privileged to participate in Christ's suffering for the church, that he is able to rejoice in his sufferings. So why, why does Paul even mention this, that he is suffering? If, to see that, we can read, I'll read for you Colossians 2 and verses 1 and 2. He says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. So even as he is undergoing suffering, his intention and his purpose and his focus is so that this church may be encouraged. <coughs> they may be united in love. So we are talking about this series of living our life with Christ at the center. So Paul understood that if he lived his life with Christ at the center, that means that he is no longer focusing on his own suffering, but his focus is on the kingdom of God, is on the church of Christ, and is on this particular church. So in light of that, his suffering was not too much to bear. Um, so have you realized that even in our life, if we really love someone or something, we don't mind suffering for them? Uh, for example, just consider a mother's love, a good example in nature, especially during childbirth. You know, a mother for ten, nine or ten months, she changes her whole lifestyle, she makes a lot of sacrifices, she changes her diet. Why? Just for her child, for the health of her child. And during childbirth, especially, she undergoes extreme pain. And she pushes through that pain, and what helps her push through that pain is you know, her concern, her love for her child, and the joy and expectation that in a few moments she'll be able to, you know, hold the child in her hands. And that joy, that expectation helps us to go through that process of pain and suffering. Uh, maybe it's not suffering in this context, but a better example of this self-sacrificial love is shown by Jesus at the cross. You know, he underwent extreme amount of pain. He went through a painful death so that you and I could be free from sin, so that our sins could be forgiven. And here 
we see that Paul mirrors this self-sacrificial love of Jesus. And the question to us is, are we willing to mirror this self-sacrificial love? Are we willing to, you know, come to a place in our commitment with Christ where we'll say, Lord, with you at the center of my life, I, I'm willing to, Lord, suffer for my fellow brothers and sisters in the church. Lord, I'm willing to bear the burdens of my brothers and sisters who are going through suffering. So that is the first thing. He knew that it was not all about himself, but it was about the church and his fellow brothers and sisters. The second reason I feel that Paul was able to rejoice in his suffering was that he had a clear identity of who he was, and he had a clear idea of his purpose, that his God-given purpose and calling. In verse 25 we see, I have become its servant, that is, he is talking about the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So here he clearly identifies himself as the servant of the church, that, the, that is the Colossian church, and also he identifies the commission that God had given him to preach the word of God to them. So when he was clear in his purpose, that enabled him to go through suffering uh, and not only endure the suffering, but rejoice in it. In verse 28, we see he, uh, Paul states, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. So that is his goal. He wants to present the Colossian church as perfect in Christ. So we have already seen that uh, this Colossian church has probably been affected by heresies or false teaching. So he, he, he is addressing this in this, the rest of the letter and his goal is to present them perfect in Christ. And to reach that goal he mentions, to, that, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy. So to reach that goal he is willing to go to any length, he is willing to go through suffering, he is willing to struggle so that the Colossian church may be perfected in the word of truth, in the word of God. Um, the word that is used for struggling in verse 29, the Greek word is usually used in the context of athletic competitions. Um, I have to admit that I'm not a sports person. Sports and I are like oil and water, we don't <laughs> mix together. But I have a great respect and admiration for athletes. Um, I, I especially admire the dedication that they have, you know, they're willing to go to any length to push their body in both physical and mentally to reach their goal. To, you know, if their goal is to win a race, they don't mind, you know, increasing the number of miles they run every day to reach that goal. And that shows us when we have a clear goal or a clear God-given purpose to our life, that will help us to stay motivated even though we are burdened by suffering or struggles. That helps us when we have a clear idea of God-given purpose in our lives to rejoice in our sufferings. So maybe you're here and you don't have a clear uh, God-given calling or you're, you have not identified it yet. I would encourage you to continue seeking God and as you seek God, God uh, will reveal his purpose to your life because he is not a God who keeps secrets or does, wants to keep it to himself. He wants to use us and he will reveal his plan for our lives and his purpose concerning our lives and how he wants to use us. Thirdly, and probably the uh, most important point that I want to make is that Paul was able to rejoice in his sufferings because he personally experienced the mystery that he was talking talking about or referring to uh, in this letter. In verses 26 and 27, we see that Paul is uh, keeps referring to this mystery that has been revealed to the Colossian church. And first he mentions the mystery as the word of God. And then in the next uh, verse, he specifies that the mystery to be Christ indwelling the believers. Um, he, sta he states the mystery as Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that statement, it has significance 
for both the present and the future. So Christ is in us already through the Holy Spirit, but the hope of glory signifies a future uh, perfection that he, that, is point, that he is pointing towards. But what does Christ in you, this mystery, have to do with rejoicing in our sufferings or enduring in our sufferings? I want to <coughs> illustrate that by reading out some of the common uh, uh, things that people say in the church to people who are suffering. Uh, the, some, uh, when someone is going through sufferings, what are the common things that people say? What, uh, the first thing is, uh, they may say, we'll just pray about it. And prayer does help, but you know, if you're really going through suffering, that's not what you're expecting. Or they may say, um, I've gone through a worse situation. And I don't think if that helps, and personally that makes me feel even worse. And um, they may also say, you may be going through this because of sin. And maybe it's true, but you know, if you're not careful about what you say, it may end up you may end up hurting the person who's already suffering more th rather than helping them. So what, what, do, what do the um, researchers say is the best way to you know, encourage someone or uh, best response that you can give to someone who is already suffering is to show them empathy and then to tell them that you will be there for them no matter what, and you will help them through. And I, I feel that this is what uh, this verse signifies to us, is that Christ in you signifies his presence in us and with us, that he is not a God who is you know, far removed from us, who just watches his children suffering and does nothing about it, but he is a God who comes and dwells with us, who's through the Holy Spirit. And he's a God who, in fact, suffers with us. So if we don't understand this aspect, you know, the rest of the points will maybe sound like the Christian cliches that I mentioned a while back. If we don't understand or realize that Christ suffers with us, then, you know, whatever the application we have, it, it may not resonate with you if you're really going through a painful experience. So here we see that Christ already suffers for the body, that is his church. And to understand that, if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26, Paul is talking about the different parts of the body of Christ and he mentions if any member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And Something that I didn't realize for a long time was Christ as the head of the body is also a member in the body. And when we suffer as part of the body, he suffers with us. And that is the hope and the encouragement that we have today, is that he, Christ, is willing to walk with us in our sufferings. He, he doesn't want us to go through this process alone. And he wants to suffer with us. And the second assurance that he gives us is, we don't have to do this on our own strength. In verse 29, Paul says, I struggle with all his energy, which refers to Christ's energy. And that word, the word energy, the Greek word used here is the same word that is used a few verses down in Colossians 2 and verse 20, where it refers to the power of God that raised Christ from the dead. So Paul is in fact saying that power of God gives me the strength to struggle to achieve God's purpose for you. And that is available to us today too. The same power that raised Christ from the dead resides in us through the Holy Spirit. And the same God who loves us so much is willing to walk with us in this process of suffering. So I don't know if you're here and maybe you're not going through 
a painful situation or you're, maybe you're not going through uh, experiencing suffering in your life. But maybe God is calling you to a greater level of commitment where you'll be able to say, Lord, I'm willing to suffer on behalf of someone else. I'm willing to bear the burdens of people in the church, of my fellow brothers and sisters. Because there are people hurting in the church around us. And if we don't help them, then who will? Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum and you are going through a painful situation or you're experiencing suffering. The solution to both of those situations is to know for sure that Christ is in you. That is the ultimate expression of Christ at the center, is to have Christ living in us, Christ dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the assurance that Christ is dwelling in you, that he is walking with you, I encourage you to open your hearts out to him and ask him to come and dwell in your life, to come and walk with you, because he is a God who will never leave you nor forsake you. And his grace is sufficient for you. And he, with his strength, we can walk through any situation that we have. I want to close this out in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the message <coughs> that you've given us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for you love us so much and that you care for us and you walk with us and that you are willing to suffer with us, God. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your presence that indwells us, God. Lord, you know everyone who is sitting here, Jesus, and if there is anyone who needs a reassurance today of your presence in their life, Lord, please answer the cries of their heart, Lord, and come and dwell in them and make your presence real in their life. We thank you once again, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job, Jeremy. 17.